Hello, my name is Ami Marais. I'm with the Lundi Lab for Quantum Photonics at the University of Ottawa, and today I'll be presenting Design of Quantum Gates and Photonic Circuits Using Geometric Phase. Now, why are we doing this? Well, in order to create a quantum computer, we first need quantum logic gates. One suitable way of achieving this is to use photonic circuits. The problem is, current photonic circuits are sensitive to manufacturing imperfections. So the question is, is it possible to create photonic circuits robust to these imperfections? Turns out the answer is yes, and the key is to use geometric phase. Now, geometric phase has been achieved in an atomic system, as the, the, this paper from 2013. But the problem is, atomic systems are not scalable, and as such, integrated photonics would be preferred. So the question is, can we use geometric phase in photonic circuits? Now, before I get to what geometric phase is specifically, I have to talk about the difference it has with dynamical phase. Now, during the evolution of an optical system, it can acquire two kinds of phases. The first being dynamical phase, which arises from an energy difference within the system. And in a waveguide system, this reduces to an effective index difference. And you can have a geometric phase, which arises from a global system change. In order to have a concrete example of this, we can look at the directional coupler. Now, when we have two waveguides, as I have in the top right here, they have individual modes when they are far apart from each other. As we bring them closer and closer together, these modes combine in order to create the symmetric and anti-symmetric supermodes. Now, these supermodes have the different effective indices, and this it is this difference which drives the system. Now, at the end of the device, there is a specific splitting ratio of the output, but this splitting ratio depends linearly on the length and the waveguide separation. And this splitting ratio within these directional couplers are therefore sensitive to fabrication errors due to dynamical phase. Now, what is geometric phase? Well, there's an intuitive example. Suppose you have the north pole of a sphere, and then you walk forward towards the equator, you sidestep the same distance, and then you backpedal the same distance again. You will now be back to your starting location, but you'll be facing a different direction. This is precisely geometric phase. Now this relied on two key things, the first being parallel transport. Now this just means that you were always facing the same direction relative to your path. So as you can see on the schematic, the arrow is always locally pointing the same direction. The other point is cyclic evolution. Now this just means that you return to your starting point, but it also implies that the dynamical phase vanishes due to cyclic evolution. Furthermore, geometric phase is proportional to the subtle angle enclosed by a path. And now, therefore, geometric phase is another way to drive the evolution in optical systems. Now, why is geometric phase advantageous? Well, robustness is built in since area and phase are invariant to local path variations. So, if we look on the left here, we have a system evolving around a certain path with no perturbations along that path. But on the right, we have the same system evolving around the same path, but towards the end, there are perturbations. Now, if these perturbations are done in an area-preserving way, then overall, the system will acquire the same geometric phase in both cases and have the same output at the end. And this is specifically where the robustness comes in. Now, this work has previously implemented geometric phase in a waveguide system using adiabatic evolution. But adiabatic evolution implies a longer device since it requires slow changes. So what we like to do is to implement a non-adiabatic geometric phase in order to enable us to create shorter, robust devices. As mentioned before, this has been done previously in an atomic system from this paper from 2013, and I will go over a little bit of the description of that system. So specifically, it is a three-level lambda system. We have two ground states, the zero and the one state, and we also have the excited state in the middle. Each ground state is coupled to the excited state by optical pulses. We drive the system with different pulses with same time-dependent envelopes, 
and it's the ratio of these optical pulse intensities that sets the type of gate that we are accomplishing. So the question becomes, how do we translate this scheme to waveguides? So it turns out that the three waveguide system is completely analogous to the three level lambda system. In our case, we have three waveguides, same name. So we have the zero, one, and excited waveguides. The outer two are coupled to the middle waveguide, and there is no coupling between the outer two since they are far enough apart to not have any coupling. We are coupled by tunneling instead of optical pulses. And in order to create the effect of pulses within the system, in order to turn on and off the coupling, we change the distance between the waveguides. Specifically, at the end of the evolution of our system, there should be no light within the middle waveguide, and we should only have light in the zero and the one waveguides. And therefore, three adjacent curved waveguides mimics a lambda level atom. Now, in order to model the coupling, we need to take into account a couple design invariants. The first being that the waveguides are all 500 nanometers wide and 220 nanometers thick, and that they are silicon waveguides on a silicon oxide substrate. We assume the coupling dies off exponentially, and then we solve numerically for coupling for two parallel straight waveguides, and this is precisely what we have on the plot. So the x-axis is the waveguide separation, and then the y-axis is effective refractive index difference, and as we can see, it does follow an exponential trend. Therefore, in order to turn on and off the coupling, the outer waveguides follow a parabolic path. Now I'll go over a couple key design parameters for our waveguides. Again, on the schematic, we have our zero excited and one waveguides. And on the vertical here, we have the x-axis. And on the horizontal here, we have the y-axis. So the first parameter is the bending coefficient. This ensures cyclic evolution. It has a value of about 20 inverse meters. This is equivalent of a change in the y-axis of about 500 nanometers, which takes place over 150 microns in the x direction. The next key parameter is the length of the device. This is set when the tunneling is insignificant, which means that the device is long enough so that the tunneling between the waveguides is significant in any longer it's there is no tunneling this value is about 300 microns in order to get the next key parameter we need to define two sub parameters the first being the minimum distance between the one waveguide and the excited waveguide this is called d naught r we have the same thing on the other side which is called d naught l specifically it's the minimum distance between the zero waveguide and the excited waveguide together they make the parameter delta D, and it's delta D that sets the ratio of tunneling rates and thus the gate type. This has a value between 0 and 100 nanometers. So as we can see, the device length is set by the minimum distance, and a smaller minimum distance implies a larger bending coefficient, which implies a shorter length. As such, we can tune our design in order to have a specific footprint. Now took over specific parameter numbers. So the two gates that we are trying to design are a 50-50 beam splitter and an inverter. So we can see that the difference in minimum separation, delta D, for the 50-50 beam splitter is 86 nanometers and for the inverter it's zero. We have the same minimum distance on the, between the zero and the one waveguide but because of the difference in delta D, we will have different minimum distance between the zero waveguide and the excited waveguide. The bending coefficient has a value of 24 inverse meters for the beam splitter and 40 inverse meters for the inverter, and both gates have a length of 300 microns. So as you can see, various gates can be created by changing the minimum waveguide separation. As for our simulations, we are using numerical mode solutions eigenmode expansion solver. This solves Maxwell's equations numerically in planes along the axis and then propagates between the planes analytically. We have a um, three nanometer mesh, 
300 planes and a continuously varying cross-section subcell method. Now the plot to the left is simply a screenshot of our device within the numerical software. Now for some simulation results, here are results for a 50-50 beam splitter. The plot is of the light intensity. The x and y axes are the location of the device within the numerical simulation. Our input is the zero waveguide. And as we can see, we have a good 50-50 split of intensity between the zero and one waveguide at the output. Also, we can see that there is no light in the excited waveguide as expected. So we can say that this is a successful 50-50 beam splitter. Here is our results for our inverter gate. It is the same plot. Our input is also at the zero waveguide. As, as we can see, we have complete light transfer between the zero and one waveguide with no light intensity at the output within the zero and excited waveguide as expected. Therefore, we can also conclude that we have a successful inverter simulation. To conclude, we have introduced a design to realize non-adiabatic quantum gate and integrated optics. Simulations confirm that these designs follow the theory. And for future work, we'd like to manufacture this chip and test the different gates to make sure that they work. And we'd also like to test the robustness that comes with geometric phase. And we will accomplish that by varying different design parameters and adding random variations along X. Thank you very much.